Well, good morning, Denver Bible Church. Today, in this message, we're going to get some false teaching. All right? So you don't always get warned in advance, right? So we're going to get some false teaching. It's like when families send their kids to public schools, and you know we've heard of so many tragic stories after you know, 13 years. But wouldn't it be great if they sent home a memo and it said, Today's the day we're going to ruin your kid's mind. That'd be so helpful, because then you'd know, okay, or, you know, let's not send them in today. Well, today we're going to get some false teaching, but at the end, we will correct it. And there's a reason for this. Beginning in September, we're going to do a series on what we believe, Denver Bible Church, what is our distinctiveness what makes us different from maybe a typical Christian church in America, what we believe and why we believe it. So today is a little bit of pre-evangelism, if you will. You know what pre-evangelism is, Ray Comfort style? You want to share with people the good news that God will save you. And that falls on deaf ears for those who think that they don't need to be saved. So that's why Ray Comfort always begins, as the Bible does, with the law of God to show people that they're guilty so that they realize that they need a Savior. So what we're going to do today is a little bit of uh, pre-evangelism to try to demonstrate how easy it is for somebody who loves the Lord and studies His Word to be very confused about doctrine and theology unless he rightly divides the scriptures. Paul says that we must rightly divide the word of God to show ourselves approved. So what we're going to do is look at a few verses from the gospels to see the kind of trouble we could get in if in fact we don't rightly divide. And then we're going to go back early in the book of Genesis and make a quick sweep through the Bible to the New Testament to see how things could actually get worse until we understand what God wants us to understand. So, I'm going to start with some of the Lord's teachings in the Gospels in Luke chapter 12, verse 33. Remember that Jesus taught that we need, His followers need to sell what we have and give alms. So we've been trying to implement that this past week at Denver Bible Church. We've had a garage sale. So people brought in everything they have, and we've been, not everything, right? They only brought in, well, if you look through it, uh, maybe not their best stuff, but they brought stuff in. It's a garage sale, right? That's fine. But look at what the Lord said in the same chapter, verse 22. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Because two verses later, Luke 12, 24 Jesus taught us that the ravens, the birds of the field, they neither sow nor nor reap, yet God feeds them. So surely we don't need to be concerned about if we have enough money for our lives because as the Lord went on, in fact, this is in one of the other Gospels, Mark chapter 6, verse 8, He commanded His own disciples, you're going to go on a, a ministry, trip i'm going in a couple weeks to dallas for ministry so jesus commanded mark 6 8 take nothing for the journey except a staff no bag right clearly the bible foreknew how much the airlines would charge for carry on and for check-in baggage so but take nothing don't worry about money don't be concerned at all about where you're going to stay Don't bring money for food. Just go. So how's that? We figured we're going to adopt these teachings at Denver Bible Church. We're going to live like this. How about Matthew 10, verse 9? Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts. This one is significant. Luke 18, 22. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and then come and follow me. So sell all that you have. You know, in the book of Acts, that's what they did, right? They sold everything. 
And this doesn't just mean the stuff that you want to get rid of at a garage sale. This means everything. They sold their homes. For those that didn't have homes, all they had was land. They were going to build a home on. They sold their land. And they gave all the money to ministry. Matthew chapter 19, verse 29. Jesus is speaking about all those who had obeyed. Everyone who has left houses and all their earthly possessions or lands for my name's sake. And he said uh, that they're the ones who shall inherit everlasting life. So what of Christians today who live like this? Because there are some, I know I've met in my years as a Christian since 1973, and I've traveled the country in, in ministry efforts. There are Christians who try to live like this. We call them homeless. That's what we call them. And they love the Lord, but they constantly have a handout. They become poor themselves. They're destitute. They have a hard time really making an impact because they need to be concerned primarily on how they're going to survive that very day. I met such a man in Golden along Clear Creek this week. I often go to Clear Creek to work on Bible studies, write articles, prepare for the show. I sit along the creek before the water gets into Coors and they ruin it, you know. And it's just so beautiful. And this guy came up and he said, I used to live in the Netherlands. I'm an American, but I'm a missionary. And uh, I, I slept last night in the woods right up here. And, and so he, uh, he takes all this literally. So it's really neat to get to share with Christians what it means to rightly divide the word of truth. Um, this here, if we were to do this and teach this, this would be multi-level marketing in reverse. That's what this would be. Uh, it doesn't work. But Jesus, He's the God of all the earth. Uh, he's our Creator. He's the source of all wisdom. So when He taught this, He wasn't wrong. He was teaching this to Israel. And there were many things that were given to Israel that if we were to do them today, Certainly, it could be because of confusion, but it also could lead to sin and to foolishness, in fact, to absurdity and to division among Christians. Millions of Christians fight over the disagreements they have about the commands God gave to Israel. You realize that? The disunity in the body of Christ, this is an easy example. That's why I'm giving this example. And for the rest of the message now, I'm going to give another easy example and like that, you think there's ever been a ministry where they go through verses like this and many more, and they say to their listeners, you need to do this, you need to give, because in fact, uh, the end times, we're in the end times, and the fourth blood moon is in September, and the Lord is going to return. So if you don't sell everything now and give it all to the church, forget the poor, um, you're going to miss the rapture. You think messages like that have ever gone out yeah the largest church in the world in uh was it in singapore tens of thousands of people sold everything and lost everything so what we're going to do now is look at another teaching in the scripture that lasted for thousands of years and it was an absolute requirement by the lord and it goes from the old testament to the new and God warned people, if you don't do this, you're going to be cut off. And so I'm going to use it as an example to show how important it is that we could rightly divide the word. Because if we abided by everything I'm about to teach, um, we would be very confused. We would be legalists. We would be undermining the gospel of grace. So let's begin way back in Genesis chapter 17. And this is where... God gave to Abraham the covenant of circumcision. So I'm going to build an argument going through the Scriptures, and the argument will be this. We need to circumcise our male children on the eighth day, according to the law. That's the argument I'm going to build now, okay? But this will be false teaching. Because it was true for Israel, if we did it today, it would be false and it would be destructive. 
because let's say we don't know, right? We're just reading through the Bible. So we come to Genesis chapter 17, and here, beginning in verse 9, And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. Every male child. Wow. Look at verse 13. Genesis 17, verse 13. You know, God calls this an everlasting covenant. He who was born in your house and he who was bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. It is beautiful, isn't it? An everlasting covenant. Now, some people might argue that well, this only applied to Israel, but as we go on, we're going to see that God, even a thousand years after this, that God applied this also to Gentiles who would come to him. We'll see that in the scriptures. And we know from the New Testament that even the Apostle Paul says that believers are the spiritual descendants of Abraham, so he might not be our father according to the flesh, but he's the father of all those who believe. So let's go now to Acts chapter 7, verse 8. And actually we'll bounce back to Genesis in a moment. But this is about Isaac. Isaac, then God gave to Abraham the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. So it's not only Abraham, right? The God of Abraham and the God of Isaac is our God. So that comes from Genesis 21, verse 4, where we read that Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old as God commanded him. And to this day, we're talking more than 4,000 years later, we have the nation of Israel that circumcises their male children on the eighth day. So there are secularists and atheists and skeptics who say, well, the this is an irrelevant book. If you want to understand the world and man's history, forget this book. It, it won't explain anything. <laughs> 4,000 years later, and not only the nation of Israel is doing the circumcising, there are millions of people who are not Jews who are circumcising. And those who follow the promise according to Isaac circumcise their boys when they're very young as infants. And those who follow through Ishmael on the way to Muhammad, they circumcised their kids when they're much older because Ishmael was 13 years old when he was circumcised. Poor kid, right? So, a few centuries after this, Moses was God's deliverer. And after working with Moses for 80 years, in Exodus chapter 4, Beginning in verse 24, God almost killed Moses. And this was before Moses, God used Moses to deliver his people out of bondage so that they could get to the promised land. And so here's what happened. You see, Moses had a wife, a Midianite wife, a Jethro's daughter, and they were not Jews. They didn't know the God of Abraham. Uh, they didn't know the covenant of circumcision. So when Moses had children with his wife Zipporah, and he suggested that they circumcise their son, she was like, you're going to do what? Are you, what? You're not going to do that to my son. That's what she said, obviously. That part's not in the text, but it's obvious. And it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. This is Moses. The Lord sought to kill Moses. After, remember, he was put in a basket and put in the Nile River, and God orchestrated all this. He ended up in the house of Pharaoh so that he could rise up and become the deliverer. The one betrayed by his own brothers would be the one to save the nation, which would foreshadow Jesus Christ being betrayed by one of his own disciples, the Savior of the world. And so this is that Moses. Many years later, in verse 25, then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet. She was angry. 
And she said, surely you are a husband of blood to me. So God let him go. Then she said, you are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. So we're only getting the concise version of this account here. But when you're on the same page that God's on, you could understand God gave to Abraham the covenant of circumcision and Moses was supposed to circumcise his son. He refused to do it. God sought to kill him. He was on his deathbed. He himself couldn't even do it. And he told his wife, if you want me to live, we have to circumcise our son. And so she did it. So how important is circumcision to God? Not very important? No, it's extremely important. It's crucial. So then Moses, through this repentant moment, is used to deliver the nation of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. And when they are in the wilderness at Mount Sinai, God gives to Moses the law. And in the telling of that law, and over the next years, we get, and Moses writes, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And right smack dab in the middle of the book of Leviticus, the third of the first five books, the Pentateuch, in Leviticus chapter 12, verse 3, in the midst of the giving of the law, God reminds Israel through Moses on the eighth day, Leviticus 12, 3, on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised, speaking of the male child. So this is important to God, right? So now fast forward about 40 years later, after the Exodus, God reinforced his covenant of circumcision. We saw it with Abraham. We saw it with Isaac. We know it went all the way through Jacob and the 12 patriarchs, through Joseph, and through Moses, and now it's the time of Joshua. And what do we have in Joshua chapter 5? In the wilderness, the nation, you know, they were traveling in the wilderness, and for whatever excuse, they ended up not circumcising their children during those years of wandering in the wilderness. So now they've crossed over the Jordan River, they've entered into the promised land, and what is the first thing God requires of Joshua as a leader? That he makes sure that the nation is circumcised. So Joshua chapter 5, verse 3, So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel. And they did so at the hill of the foreskins, but that's another story altogether. <laughs> In verse 8, so it was when they had finished circumcising all the people that they stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. So this is real, right? Is this make-believe? Is this just a minor, insignificant teaching and passing that God doesn't really care about? Except He would kill Moses after 80 years of working in his life to prepare him for the Exodus. He would have killed him even then because of how serious this is. Now we fast forward to 1,000 years, nearly 1,000 years after Joshua, to the prophet Ezekiel. And God required circumcision even for the Gentiles who would come to the Lord through Israel's ministry. Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 9. Thus says the Lord God, no foreigner uncircumcised in heart or uncircumcised in flesh shall enter my sanctuary, including any foreigner who is among the children of Israel. So if you want to enter into the sanctuary of your Lord and you were there at the time of Ezekiel, now Abraham lived long before that and Isaac long before and Moses long before and Joshua a thousand years before Ezekiel. And you're not even a Jew. You, you were not born in their house or bought with their money as a slave. By the way, Jesus was born in their house and bought with their money when the high priest paid 30 pieces of silver. And in Genesis, it says, born in your house or bought with your silver. And that happened to Jesus Christ, who was circumcised and he was literally cut off in the flesh 
which is what circumcision means. But at any rate, by the time of Ezekiel, we see that, of course, God required of Israel that they be circumcised, but then even of the Gentiles who want to come in and worship. We get to the New Testament and John the Baptist. Jesus said, of all those born to women, there's none greater than John. And in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, you know that John the Baptist was circumcised on the eighth day, as was the custom of the Jews from ancient times till today. And he was given his name as he was being circumcised, as was their custom. And that also happened to Jesus. But Luke chapter 1, verse 59, So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. But then Zacharias wrote that his name will be John, and they called him John. So the Baptist was circumcised on the eighth day according to the law. Let's say we went to a church that was a legalistic church, and they didn't rightly divide, and they were a bit confused. And they got to this point, and they were teaching, and they said, don't you think it's important that we circumcise our children? Don't you think that? Do you want your child to go to hell because of your disobedience? They'd be like, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't want that. Well, then we need to teach this to our neighbors. We need to teach that this is an everlasting covenant. But maybe somebody would get to this point and still hold out hope because they really just didn't want to do it. And maybe they think, well, that was John, but that wasn't Jesus. That wasn't the apostles. Well, the apostles were all circumcised. And the one apostle who was the least likely maybe to be circumcised because God sent him to the Gentiles, he was Paul, Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. But we read about Paul from Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 4, Paul is saying, I might have confidence in the flesh. If we could have confidence in who we are in our flesh, then I, maybe I could. Because, he says, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence, I more so, because I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. So was Paul circumcised? Of course he was. All male children in Israel at the time of the Lord were circumcised. In fact, so was Jesus. And we'll go back to the Gospel of Luke for this. In Luke chapter 2, verse 21, we find out that Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day because the law commanded that. And of course, we're to be followers of the Lord, right? And when eight days were completed, Luke 2.21, when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So that's a little detail in the Bible that's easily missed, right? Had you ever thought about that Jesus was called Jesus when he was eight days old? That's when he was called Jesus. Just like John was called John when he was eight days old. This is like, this is the day you get your identity as a member of God's covenant people, as a male child on the eighth day. So they would even give you your name on that day. Joseph and Mary were doing all this according to the law. For just a few verses after that, we read in Luke 2.27, So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to to the custom of the law. You notice that? They were following and keeping the law. That's why they now went to the temple to offer thanksgiving to the Lord for their male child. And that's why they had earlier circumcised. We see that in verse 39. And so when they, Joseph and Mary, when they had performed all these things according to the law of the Lord, was it just the law of the land? Was it man's law? Was it just tradition? Just custom? No, this was the law of the Lord. When they performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. 
So wouldn't it be a shame if we aired this message and at this point we ran out of time and we said, well, go to the website for the rest of the message. And there are people thinking, oh no, we've got to circumcise our kids. That'd be terrible. But do you see how easy it is to take from the Scriptures and be as determined as you could be to be careful and to be thorough and to look at what is on the Lord's heart and come out with the exact wrong doctrine. The exactly wrong doctrine. So let's continue. You know, Jesus taught that if you break one of the least of the commandments, that you will be called least in the kingdom. That's in Matthew chapter 5. And let's look at verse 17. Matthew 5, verse 17. Jesus said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Now they wrote in Greek. If they they had written in English, Jesus would have said, not one crossing of a T or a dotting of an I. That's the jot and the tittle. Not the least bit of the law will pass. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments. This is verse 19. Now circumcision, was it one of the least or was it one of the greater commands? It was one of the greatest commands. Sabbath, was the Sabbath law an important command? The Sabbath, that's in the Ten Commandments, right? Well, Jesus teaches that the commandment of circumcision was greater than the Sabbath law. Circumcision. Greater than the Sabbath. After all, the Sabbath wasn't given till Moses, where circumcision was given centuries earlier to Abraham. And Moses was circumcised before he had ever heard of the Sabbath command. So Jesus said, if you break one of the least of these commandments and you teach others so, you will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So if if this were a false teaching sermon, then by this point we'd say, well, do you want to be one of the least? Are you going to teach others not to obey God's law? When God says it's an everlasting covenant, you have to circumcise. By the way, if you've been caught up in the doctrinal debate about whether or not Christians should keep the Sabbath. We have had this debate online. It's a a wonderful uh, teaching, and it's almost, it's very similar to this teaching. But it has its own very interesting aspects. And I'll tell you how to find that. kgov.com slash Sabbath. Should Christians keep the Sabbath with a Seventh-day Adventist who believes we should keep the Sabbath. Okay. So, um, Jesus is saying you got to keep the commandments, the least and the greatest. And remember, back from Moses, in the middle of Leviticus, God said you got to circumcise. So it's part of the law. In fact, when I mention that circumcision takes precedence even over the Sabbath, command in John chapter 7 the gospel of John chapter 7 the Lord speaks about these two commandments circumcision and the Sabbath and he does so in a way that makes it clear that circumcision takes precedence over the Sabbath because on the Sabbath you cannot work right God says don't work on the Sabbath circumcision requires work and we think well it's not too much work maybe you never did it but circumcision requires work and it's a work of the flesh circumcision is a work of the flesh and if starting a fire doesn't seem like too much work god said you can't kindle a fire you can't pick up sticks on the sabbath do no work so now if your child was born on a friday What day of the week would he be eight days old? On a Saturday, which is the Sabbath. So you'd have a dilemma because now it's the Sabbath and you have to perform a circumcision, which is work. So what do you do? Which of the commands do you violate? Do you violate the circumcision and wait till the ninth day? Or do it on the seventh day? Or do you violate the Sabbath? Do you profane the Sabbath to keep circumcision? 
That would be a dilemma, right? Could you imagine rabbis arguing over that? I could imagine that very easily. And so here we have in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, Jesus said, If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken. You get that? Jesus is saying, of course, even if it's on the Sabbath, you still circumcise the child so that you don't break the law. Because the law requires you to circumcise even if it profanes the Sabbath. And then Jesus said, are, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? The Lord is pointing out that it'd be real easy to criticize me for breaking the Sabbath, but realize you do the same thing every time you circumcise a child on Saturday. The Gospel of John, chapter 7, that was verse 23. Maybe I should have begun with verse 22. John 7, 22. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on a Sabbath. So why would you circumcise a man on a Sabbath? It's so that the covenant of circumcision, which takes precedent, would not be broken. But all that was what Jesus taught while he was on earth, right? That was all while he was on earth. This is not after the resurrection. And that's a, there's something you could watch for when you, you hear a Christian teacher and they're challenged about something they teach and you're going through the Bible and they realize that what is in the Gospels is not what they teach, it's not what they believe. And so as a way out, they tend to say this. They'll say, well, that was before the resurrection. Say, so, oh, that was before the resurrection. So after the resurrection, then Jesus said, um, everything I taught you for the last three years, all that, forget all that, because now it's all different. Is that what Jesus did? No. In Matthew chapter 28, what did the Lord say in what is called the Great Commission? After the resurrection, he told the apostles to teach all nations to obey all the laws that he had commanded them to observe. So Matthew 28, 20 teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So, so Jesus didn't teach for three years just to have it all chucked away because now there's something brand new. Jesus taught so that they would be equipped to take his teachings on to the nation of Israel, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's why the Lord did all this. So we're up to this point, the end of the Gospels, and it seems pretty clear that um, if it wasn't for Paul's ministry, we would still be circumcising, wouldn't we? We'd still be keeping the Sabbath. We'd still be keeping the dietary law. And many other laws we would be keeping to this very day. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 23, 23, he's speaking to the scribes and Pharisees. He calls them hypocrites. And he said, you pay tithe, you tithe of the herbs that you grow in your garden. So you have some peppermint leaves, you count them, you got 30 leaves, you take three, and you give those three little leaves to the temple. So you tithe even of the herbs in your garden. Jesus said, you know, pretty good, good job there you hypocrites, because he said you've neglected the weightier matters of the law. You should have done the least matters and kept the weightier matters of the law both. So circumcision, is it one of the least or is it one of the greater commands? It's one of the greater because it's God's covenant people. They're the covenant. They are called the circumcision. Yeah, but isn't it true today that really all God wants is for us to be circumcised in our hearts, right? Isn't that true? Because Paul does say something like that to the Roman Christians. He said, you know, we're circumcised of our hearts. So that must mean that we could forget everything in the Old Testament and everything in the Gospels. But if we look back in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16, we read this circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Don't be st stiff-necked. 
Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts. See, God used the same metaphor with Israel in the Old Testament, be circumcised of heart. That doesn't mean you don't have to be circumcised. It just means let your heart also be tender toward the Lord. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of all your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. So of course we have to circumcise. And it doesn't matter if we need to be circumcised of heart. You also have to be circumcised in the flesh. And is that far enough? Well, maybe we could go to the book of Acts. Because Acts chapter 21, verse 21, we find out the Apostle James is presiding over the believers in Jerusalem, and he wants to quell a rumor that the Apostle Paul is teaching all the Jews to forsake Moses and to not be circumcised. That was a rumor about Paul. So, James, we read in Acts 21, verse 21, James says, but all these Jews here, they've been informed about you, Paul, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. So Paul was teaching that to the Gentiles. Don't circumcise. He wasn't going to all the Jews and saying, he wasn't going to all the synagogues and saying, you guys have to stop circumcising. He wasn't doing that. So you got to sort of understand the nuances of the message that God gave to Paul for Jews and Gentiles, but that was pretty much a misrepresentation of what Paul was doing. So Paul was willing to try to set aside that concern. So James said, what then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they'll hear, Paul, that you've come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow at the temple. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. So does Paul keep the law? Well, Paul said, when I go to the Jews, I go as one under the law. When I go to Rome, I go as one not under the law because God, Jesus Christ, told Paul that he's no longer under the law. But the 12 apostles in Jerusalem and their converts, they were still under the law. So Paul could go to them under the law. And when he goes to Rome and Corinth and Philippi, he goes as one not under the law and he teaches his converts don't keep the law. What does he say about circumcision? Well, we'll do that in just one minute, but one last verse first. The book of Acts, six chapters earlier, Acts 15, verse 1. Acts 15, 1. Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren... These were Bible teachers who were followers of the Lord. And they worked for James in Jerusalem. They taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Is this an Old Testament issue or a New Testament issue? This is a New Testament issue. I think there are tens of millions of Christians who never heard any of this. Do you think that's possibly true? And so, Acts chapter 15, verse 5. But some of the sect of the Pharisees, the Pharisees were their Bible teachers, who believed in Jesus, rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So now we come to the end of our message. If we ended right there, the whole sermon would be false teaching. It would all be false teaching. And people would go away completely confused because they have not been taught to rightly divide the word of truth. But we get to the book of Galatians, the first book written in the New Testament, historically. Chapter 1 begins with Paul saying, the 12 apostles, they hardly even know me. 
If I showed up in one of their churches, they wouldn't even recognize me by face. Only three of them would recognize me, and I only spent a couple weeks with Peter. That's about it. Imagine that. Paul said, they don't know even my face. Before God, I am not lying. Isn't that dramatic? I mean, how dramatic do you have to be? to Say, they, they, I don't hang out with them. They don't know me. I didn't get my authority from them. I got it directly from Jesus. And it's different than the authority they have. And so this is what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 5, verse 2. That's at the end of this extraordinary book where Paul ends up confronting Peter, the Apostle Peter. In Galatians 2, he says, Peter was lying about the Gospel and I confronted him to his face. That's another passage in the New Testament that is not taught in our churches. So Paul has something very different going on than the covenant of circumcision with Israel. So Jesus told Paul to write this, Galatians 5, verse 2. Indeed, I, Paul, not Peter, not John, not Ezekiel, not Joshua, not Moses, not Isaac, not Abraham, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. So do you see how easy it would be? Circumcision is something that the church pretty much got over quickly, and partly for racial reasons and other reasons. But let's say it's the Sabbath. Let's say we did the exact same thing with the teachings of the Sabbath. And we get to this key point, and then we end our Bible study. And we say, do you realize the Sabbath is a perpetual covenant with God between God and His people, and if you don't keep His Sabbath, you are going to hell. And so the whole church is convinced we got to keep the Sabbath. But they just happen to conveniently leave off where God turned to the Apostle Paul and gave him the covenant of grace for the Gentiles, which God said, this is the uncircumcision. We have the covenant of circumcision, now we have the covenant of the uncircumcision. The rules have changed. And then Paul gives us Many of the rules that have changed. So that today, the body of Christ is unable to stand for something as simple and fundamental as marriage from the Scriptures because they're scared to death that in public, someone will quote a Bible verse that will mock them because they won't be able to respond why that verse is not relevant and this other verse about marriage should be relevant. So when we rightly divide the word of truth, we could understand what God wants for us today. So let's now look to the Lord and ask Him to help us to do just that. Our Father God in heaven, we thank You, Lord, for Your word. We thank You that You've made it clear if only we will take the time to look. You've made it clear what we should be, believe how we should behave. Please help us, Lord. Help us to desire to know your word so that we can better know you. Help us to be well equipped as we open the scriptures to share with our children or share with others that we might know what it is that we read and understand. Please help us, Lord. We love you. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.